So the, the Brooklyn 5G Summit is um, one of the, the, the unique aspects is it brings together leading industry uh, people together with academics working in 5G. Uh, this is something which is kind of lacking at least in North America. Mm -hmm. Uh, I must point out in this context that there's a huge amount of activity in Europe and Asia around 5G. Tremendous resources have been put into research, uh, academic research, uh, and the U.S. is far behind in this area, so that's something I'm very concerned about. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, I think this, uh, uh, from a North American context, was a very unique event. Uh, it was sponsored uh, by Nokia, and so they, they did a great job. Uh, helping us put it together. Mm -hmm. um, all the major uh, wireless equipment providers were represented, uh, some carriers as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was organized around themes, uh, and we, uh, it was a fully curated event uh, in the sense that we made sure we had the right people to talk on the right subject in mm -hmm. the right event. It was a single track. Um, a series of talks mm -hmm. uh, and for that reason I think we were getting people at the CTO level attending uh, all the key researchers, um, key faculty and you're aware of the activity at the University of Texas, we mm -hmm. have many of their top uh, researchers in 5G here as well as from other places and so for that reason I think there were, this is the first event where I got calls from people how do I get into this event, and how do you put me on the invitee list? You know, right. so it, it was it it was, uh, but we didn't want it to be a huge thousand person event. We wanted to keep it intimate. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, interaction, the corridors, so to speak, were going on, which I thought I heard walking past some of them. I think a lot of uh, good conversations going on, and as you know, this whole effort is to build up towards an industry standard at some point. Mm -hmm. Uh, because 5G is still an amorphous set of technologies, people have different views of what 5G should be. So I think these kind of events are key in bringing together uh, people across different companies who will eventually compete, but at this point need to cooperate to bring about a single standard. Okay. What were some of the uh, in the hallway buzz topics? What was what were people chatting about in terms of either commercial? Potential or just exciting technology? I think right now it is exciting technology in the context of commercial uh, you know, projections or potential. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they're already, uh, I mentioned millimeter waves, so that's one of the candidate technologies right. for 5G. And the question is how would it come about? So, some companies are a little more conservative. They're thinking that first, let's develop it as a backhaul technology, point right. to point links. Um, others are more aggressive. They think it's ready for uh, the last <laughs> <laughs> 10 meters to, to the user, right? Right. And um, so, so I think that was one of the themes. Uh, the other is uh, actually the propagation modeling is also something which has to be done very carefully. As you know from 4G efforts, the industry very quickly uh, converged to a single model uh, to use. And the question is, what is the right model? How would it operate, let's say, in an urban environment? Could it be scalable so that you could use it to essentially plan out 5G networks? Mm -hmm. That was another theme that I heard about. Uh, this, this notion of latency, which I mentioned earlier, that was uh, something the people who are discussing how, how to achieve those kind of mm -hmm. latencies. Um, and, and then uh, the high layer issues, that is hand off the control plane. Right. So some people are proposing that the control plane be handled by 4G technology because you need less bandwidth but more reliable bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So if you could operate um, in the microwave uh, bands. So that, that was, uh, and in fact the whole handoff between 5G and 4G is another issue that people are very uh, interested in. Well, in the early days of cellular technology, carriers would have a full 10 years to uh, get a return on in that investment. Here we are a couple years into LTE deployment, mm -hmm. and we're just now starting to see the voice over LTE. Why do we need 5G? 
Okay, so to some extent we are anticipating demand, right? We, are, we certainly see this secular shift away from wireline to wireless, right? That's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Fewer and fewer people have desktop computers and things like that. So, so, uh, so that in that sense, we are projecting out into the future, and we feel that the current bandwidths are not sufficient to support uh, new applications. Um, the carriers, naturally, as you're probably alluding to, have a concern about the return on investment. They've just spent billions of dollars uh, rolling out 4G LTE. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, will they spend several more billion dollars for 5G uh, without recovering the investment? And that certainly is another conversation <laughs> in the hallways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a tough one, except, and this is a personal view, is that we've already seen a huge shift in our personal um, purchase uh, of telecommunications products towards wireless. Uh, you know, earlier people used to complain if they spend more than thirty dollars a month on their cell phone bill. Now people are routinely paying three hundred. You know, <laughs> I mean, at least some, quite a few people are paying three hundred or at least a hundred dollars. So I think people are spending more because they're getting more value out of it. Mm -hmm. Clearly, mm -hmm. and so uh, in that sense, the return on investment may 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 be may be there. Okay. Uh, the other is. Uh, of course, other technologies like the Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communications, which are not based on individual users, but other applications. Mm -hmm. You mentioned vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. A whole set of new application domains and people willing to pay for those may arise when uh, we get 5G. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Pause for a minute and uh, I want to go into another question if we could. Sure. Um, I want to talk about 5G, uh, 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 gigabit service. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Um, so, Shiv, earlier we talked about latency as one of the key characteristics of 5G, but we didn't really talk about throughput or bandwidth. Um, gigabit is a big word today. Do you believe that uh, gigabit service over wireless or cellular technology is, is a reality? So, it is certainly, I believe, te technically feasible to deliver a gigabit per user. Um, you, uh, so using, uh, there's plenty of bandwidth in millimeter wave in particular. Uh, you could assign a gigabit per user. The number of users per cell is shrinking as cell size are shrinking. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's certainly uh, feasible to get a gigabit per user. Now, what may be another question is related to your last one is what will you do with a gigabit per second per user? And uh, that's, I think, a valid question. I remember, I've been in this business a long time. Um, in the 1980s, I remember IBM did a study. What is the maximum anybody could ever want in terms of bandwidth? I think IBM does a lot of these kind of studies. <laughs> you remember the famous, we need only six supercomputers in the world. So they, uh, their conclusion, I think, had some validity. They said you will never need more than 25 megabits per second, okay, if you recall that. And that has kind of held for 30 years. Uh, uh, so what, why would you need more than 25 megabits per second, except perhaps for bragging rights, you know? Um, um, and that's a, that's a very good question, because I think most people would be satisfied if they had reliable 25 megabit per second service mm -hmm. that can take care of the streaming video needs and you would get really fast file downloads. But it is possible that in, uh, that in the future, um, just that as we mentioned with latency, I think uh, things like virtual reality needs a lot of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, gaming, cooperative gaming across the network would need low latency and fairly high bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, you know, Google Glasses didn't quite work out, but maybe in, in the future, some next version of it may work out. Mm -hmm. And so, so those bandwidth needs may creep up along with this lower latency requirement that we discussed earlier. Yeah, what's the uh, relationship then between, if you, let's take connected car for example and crash avoidance, mm -hmm. where you have, uh, you know, you have the Google car that has a 360 degree camera, if you will, and mm -hmm. it's, it's monitoring what's, what's around it. Is there a relationship between latency and, and throughput? 
And what I mean by that, if I'm watching on my infotainment center, I got three kids in the back and they're all streaming, you know, high definition video, mm -hmm. okay, but I still need headroom for crash avoidance, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to road. So if I get that video down faster, then theoretically there's more bandwidth available for crash avoidance. Is there a relationship there or not? Probably not. I would like to keep the video needs of your kids in the back seat away from the <laughs> crash avoidance <laughs> network. You know, there should be some segregation. They should be, they should be separate. Yes, yes. But so you don't see any um, real, real demand there between, or the relationship between the two? I, I do not, uh, uh, and um, I think they should be engineered very differently. Um, and and I, as I said, the latency and reliability of communications is, is, is first and foremost in that kind of application. Yeah. Okay. Uh, final question. You talked earlier about the amount of investment being made by the European Union or, or other European countries compared to in R&D yes. versus the U.S. Can you expand on that a little bit more? So if, so I've done only a cursory look at this, but even a cursory look reveals that the European Union has, through uh, its uh, research uh, budgets and also its national research budgets of individual countries, put, I would venture at least two orders of magnitude more money mm -hmm. into 5G research. They have uh, national centers. The University of Surrey in England has a 5G center with tens, if not over 100 million pounds mm -hmm. invested. Uh, we have, uh, EU has multiple initiatives in this area, which aggregates all the research going on across different countries along with the companies. Uh, as you know, um, while uh, in terms of companies, there is no uh, I mean, with the uh, exception of Alcatel Lucent, which is half American, half French, there is no major American vendor in this area also uh, mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the base station, of course. Right. We are, we are, so, so this is something which sh I, I don't know if we can have a, you know, a, a, a national plan for 5G. I don't think uh, the, that's the U.S. style. We don't do those kind of things. But that's something we should think about. I mean, should we just do a complete laissez-faire approach to this also? Uh, where is the happy median between those two extremes? Because right now it's more or less laissez-faire. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the trend for uh, research facilities associated with universities? Is, is the trend for funding going up or is it, it going down? And I'll give you some context. I, had, I was talking with a, a friend of mine last night in Austin, Texas, who's a tenured professor at UT, and we were having a conversation about research and development budgets at universities, and his opinion was they're under extreme pressure from the legislatures at the state levels right. um, that they really don't want to fund R&D. Is that a trend that you're seeing nationally? I, there, there is concern. I mean, what has happened is that even though, uh, I don't have the figures in front of me, uh, the gross amount of research dollars is probably flat I believe as a percentage of our GDP, it's been falling. Mm -hmm. um, so the other concern I have is with the loss of the large industry R&D labs. You know, Bell Labs is not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. All the other industry uh, company labs are not what they used to be. Uh, there is a deficit in R&D for the future. A lot of the more applied research which used to go on in industry labs is uh, is something which universities are attempting to do. And some parts of it they can do well. If you're doing something in software, you can very quickly turn out something, you can even do a startup. But if it's hardware-oriented, as you go lower in the protocol stack, if mm -hmm. it's something to do with standards, this is something companies do best. And uh, to expect universities to take up that slack, I think is putting a heavy burden on them. So in that context, I, I am concerned about this, if you look at the combination of academic and industry mm -hmm. research, especially in the U.S. 